Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? This morning, we're going to be reading out of Job 8, 11. Can the rush grow up without mire? Now, the New King James, it calls it papyrus. And the rush, basically, it was a um, a reed or a, a, it was kind of a fibrous plant. It could even could have even been the stalks from the, I don't think the stalks from the cattail work as well because they have a core in them and you can eat the core. Um, but it was a, a fibrous plant. And they would pound that out, make the scrolls and paper and stuff like that out of it. We have tons of them that are on there. Uh, because once it was made, you know, dried and made into paper, because it was easy to manipulate, it made really good paper. Um, surprisingly good paper. Uh, it's the same thing as uh, willow bark. Willow bark, when you strip it, soak it in water, and then you, and of course you can get aspirin out of that. But you strip it down to thin strips and then wa weave it together. It makes a really strong rope. Um... And so the, this papyrus, this reed, was what they what they used uh, in a lot of cases. And there was other stuff that, that fell into that. But this was, I think, probably the primary one because it was easy to grow. It grew wild easily everywhere. So the verse in the New King James says, Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? These plants can't. They only grow in those areas. And so... Let's say you have two marshy spots in a, in a landscape and around one of them, you see these reeds, you see this papyrus, this, this, this stuff growing. And then you'll have, you know, good dirt in between to the other one. And around the other pond, you'll have those reeds. Nothing will grow in between them. The, 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 none of those reeds will bridge the gap. They'll only grow around those moist, wet areas, muddy areas. Because it's the kind of plant they are. They're made for that. Now, let's read this in context because I think it's the Lord trying to teach Job a lesson or somebody teaching Job a lesson. Or maybe even Job. Let's go up here. Okay, we'll start here. Verse 5. If you would earnestly seek God and make your supplication to the Almighty, if you were pure and upright, surely now he would awake for you and prosper uh, your rightful dwelling place. Now, this is one of Job's supposed friends, Bildad, actually. So this is Bildad speaking. And we know later in this book that, because I did a playlist on this, later in this book, it, it turns out that his friends actually are, his friends are actually trying to ruin him <laughs> instead of encourage him. And he knew, and he makes that evident that he knew and calls him out. Though your beginning was small, verse 7, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. For inquire, please, of the former age and consider the things discovered by their fathers. For we were born yesterday and know nothing, because our days on earth are a shadow. This is an interesting statement he's making here. Though your beginning was small, yet Job was the richest person in the land, yet your latter end would increase abundantly. That's the truth. But is he speaking spiritually or is he speaking carnally? For inquire, please, of the former age. What age would it would have been before them? Is he talking about going back to Adam? Because Job was before Abraham, I believe. No, I'll take that back. Job was after Abraham, I think. So what age is he referring to? Before every, anything was created? I don't know. Uh, and consider the things discovered by their fathers. So I'm, I'm guessing by his speech here, he's talking about the previous age. And the age usually runs about 2,000 years. The previous age prior to the one he's living in. For we were born yesterday and know nothing. Yet these are grown men. So he, he understands we are young. We don't know anything. Because our days on earth are a shadow. That seems to tell me he might be talking about something else other than people. Possible. Will they not teach you and tell you and utter words from their heart? Can the papyrus grow up without a marsh? Can the reeds flourish without water? While it is yet green and not come down, it withers before any other plant. Because it's a very tender plant. So are the paths of all who forget God. <coughs> and the hope of the hypocrite shall perish whose confidence shall be cut off. 
and whose trust is a spider's web. He leans on his house, but it does not stand. He holds it fast, but it does not endure. He grows green in the sun, and his branches spread out in his garden. His roots wrap around the rock heap and look for a place in the stones. If he is destroyed from his place, then it will deny him, saying, I have not seen you. Behold, this is the joy of his way, and out of the earth others will grow. Behold, God will not cast away the blameless, nor will he uphold the evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughing and your lips with rejoicing. Very interesting speech is going on here. Now, I've covered some of this in um, the playlist. And, and just keep in mind, you know, these playlists that I do, they're not, you're not, you know, it's not everything in there. They're, they're not, it's not every single thing we can find. It, the idea is to inspire you guys to read it. But just like we see some certain things here, like he's alluding to something else. And that's what we discovered then too. And that's what's funny about some of the interactions is that you you see what they're saying, but when you stop and think about it for a minute, you're like, wait, what is he talking about? Is he talking about something much bigger than than that? And it's all part of the wording of the Lord and what he put in there. It's actually very interesting. There's so much more in this book. We just have to, I mean, in our lifetime, we can never learn it. You studied the Bible for a thousand years, you can never learn everything in it. The rush is spongy and hollow, and even so is a hypocrite. There is no substance or stability in him. So they're soft on the inside. They may seem like they're hard on the outside, but they're soft on the inside. And that's the truth. If you're ever near a pond and you see those bulrushes growing up in that, go over and just squish one in your hands and you'll see the outside is real fibrous, but it kind of crushes. It is shaken to and fro, in every wind, just as formalists yield to every influence. For this reason, the rush is not broken by the tempest, neither are hypocrites troubled with persecution. I would not willingly be a deceiver or be deceived. Perhaps the text for this day may help me to try myself whether I be a hypocrite or no. The rush by nature lives in water and owes its very existence to the mire and moisture wherein it has taken root. Let the mire become dry and rush withers very quick and the rush withers very quickly. So they, it needs that wet land in order to grow. Its greenness is absolutely dependent upon circumstances. I think I just know where he's going here. So the only way that bull rush is able to survive and grow is by the circumstances it finds itself in. A present abundance of water makes it flourish and a drought destroys it at once. Is this my case? Do I only serve God when I'm in good company or when religion is profitable and respectable? And this is a great issue for Christians today. They're a Christian as long as everything runs smooth. But as soon as things start getting a little off, like what we've seen the last five years, especially the last two, how people have started to accept things they should, they know they're not supposed to be accepting about other people, trans community, the homosexual community, the Satanism. And they're openly in, in, accepting that stuff. They're knowingly letting that stuff in by the front door. Do I only serve God when I'm in good company or when religion is profitable and respectable? Do I love the Lord only when temporal comforts are received from his hands? Am I a believer because of what the Lord can do for me? A lot of people, this is the thing. As long as they're getting what they want, they're a believer. As long as it's it's a, it's a financial benefit or a, 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 or a carnal or physical benefit, or, you know, physical th things. <coughs> They're happy. As soon as that changes, they're not. This is the big tool that the Lord uses to purge his church. Because, and it's happening now. We see people leaving in droves. I mean, they said that the exodus from the quote-unquote Christian faith worldwide is exponential. And it's, it's they said it's frightening because it's happening so fast. Yet the people are still going to churches. And yet they're leaving the truth. The Bible told us this. The great apostasy is going to happen. It will be a defection from truth. That's what's happening. That's literally what's happening. A lot of people say that's not it. Then how do you explain what's happening? 
It's literally, this is what the Bible described. They're leaving truth. They know what truth is. They're leaving it. Some of the Christian, some of the Christian community's worst enemies are other Christians. I think we are attacked more by our own that are named by us, like we are than those outside. And so they're only Christians as long as everything goes good. As soon as everything goes bad, nope. They deny it. If so, I'm a base hypocrite. And like the withering rush, I shall perish when death deprives me of outward joys. And this is the big issue for a lot of people. What am I getting? Do I feel happy about that? And they don't like it. They will attack somebody if they come towards them with the truth. Because it takes away their joys, it takes away their sin, it takes away the things they, they love. But can I honestly assert that when bodily comforts have been few, and that can be described by anything we go through today, I mean, I, I have no reason to get out of bed in the morning. It hurts too much. I'm in pain right now sitting here. It's just the way of life. It, what I do here, the only comfort it offers me is the comfort of knowing that I'm able to serve my God and serve my brothers and sisters in, in a small way by doing this. That's it. I took the money out of the equation. There's no way to, to monetize this. I showed that in the video. I, I, I set it up that way on purpose. I even closed my AdSense account that I used to have. There's no way I can monetize these videos. I don't want to monetize them. I don't want money to be a factor. I don't do it for accolades. Because there's no reason to. I'm not the one that's running the show. It is him. What is there to gain from doing this? As a human being. Almost nothing. But I still get up and do it. And I enjoy doing it. I love doing these videos. That's a big difference between what I'm doing here and how I'm doing it and why I'm doing it versus a lot of other people. Other people do it because they get donations, because they get take the money out of the equation, stop donating to those other channels, watch how fast they shut that channel down. If it's not making them money, they're not going to keep doing it because they don't do it for the love of the word. They don't do it for the love of the Lord and his glorification. But can I honestly assert that when bodily comforts have been few and my surroundings have been rather adverse to grace, then at all helpful to it, I have still held fast my integrity. And this goes back to what I had said before. What would you still call Jesus Lord? Would you still worship him? Would you still love him if he said you fell short of the mark and you had to go to torment? You had to go to, to eternity and darkness. Would you still love him and call him Lord? If you can still love him and call him Lord then, then you can certainly still love him and call him Lord when things are going right. And that's a hard question to answer for each of us. We can't just snap decision and say, yeah, I would. We have to have to think about it. Would I Would I be mad at him for doing that? Or would I love him anyway? It comes down to he's the one running the show and he knows things we don't know. Then, if we hold fast to our integrity, like he says, I have still held fast to my integrity. If we hold fast to that, then have I hope that there is genuine, vital godliness in me. So if none of those things matter, if, if none of those things sway you from him, because you're there for him, not there for them. That was one of the issues I ran into in my last church. You had to be there for the people. It was all about them and their, what was going for them. It was, it was all about those. It had nothing to do or very little to do with the glory of God. I'm here because of God. I'm here because of Jesus Christ. I'm not here because of the other people. And that's a lot of churches today. Men go there to meet women. Women go there to meet men. Some of them go there for even worse reasons. Because the church is full of very easily manipulated people. Especially children. And I hate to even mention that, but that's the case today. Unfortunately. Why are we a Christian? Is it because of what we can get out of the deal? Or is it because of what Jesus Christ is doing? And that we get an opportunity to glorify him and have the unique privilege, the unique blessing of being called by his name. 
The rush cannot grow without mire, but plants of the Lord's right hand planting can and do flourish even in the year of drought. <clears throat> a godly man often grows best when his worldly circumstances decay. This is a difference between a truly born-again person and someone who's a false professor. When things get bad, who runs back to the world? When things get bad, who holds fast to their faith, if not growing even more strongly in that belief of Jesus Christ? When things are the worst, do you swing back the way you used to be or swing forward the way you should be? When things get bad, do you run to him or run away from him? And this is the big difference. This is the big difference between who's who. And I can tell you that if you took a thousand Christians from the world today, from all parts of the planet, dropped them into a room, and then started experiments with like that, you would see that the majority of them would run away. And only a few would hang around. In every church with a hundred or more people, the average, roughly, is about 10% of that congregation is actually saved. Now, there are some exceptions to the rule. There are some where everybody in there, if not just a couple, aren't. Everybody's saved. But a godly man often grows best when his worldly circumstances decay. He who follows Christ for his bag is a Judas. Judas Iscariot followed Christ because he got to run the money. He got to handle the money, and he was stealing it. They who follow for loaves and fishes are children of the devil. The people that were out there, the 5,000, and I talked about this in another video. I'll mention this again. When you read that story that he fed the 5,000, he didn't feed 5,000. It was 5,000 men with wives. That's another 5,000. And this is just a general assumption. Let's say they all have at least one child, which most of the time, most of those households had multiple children. But let's say one child. That's you're already up to 15,000 people. If they had a second child, 20,000. You see how quickly that number grows. They fed a lot of people. And when the food was gone, they all left. When Jesus started preaching conviction, they all left. They were there for a free meal. That's it. That's all they wanted. And, th and that's the big thing today, the big problem today with people who go to church. They're there for a free meal. They're not there for Jesus Christ. They're not there to worship the Lord. They're not there for the love of God. They're there for themselves. 2,000 years ago, same thing was going on. They who follow for loaves and fishes are children of the devil. But they who attend him out of love to himself are his own beloved ones. This is who the bride is, the one who loves the Lord regardless, the one who is going after the Lord regardless. So let's say we go back to the old ceremony of the Jewish wedding. So a guy would pick his bride. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'll be back. I'll be back to get you so I can take you to live with me. And so she starts preparing herself. He leaves. A year passes. During that year, later, the later in that year, say nine months into that year, people are like, he hasn't come back for you. Like he's, he hasn't even left his father's house. He hasn't come back for you. And you're going to have the people that are going to come up and start doing that. Did he forget about you? Is he going to go get another wife? He hasn't shown up. And we haven't seen him anywhere. He hasn't been working or anything. Where is he? You don't, we don't hear from him or nothing. Where is he? Did he forget about you? If that woman isn't dedicated to that husband, she's going to say, you know what? I'm going to go find another husband. That's a false professor. That's a, that's a denier of Christ. That's a hypocrite. Ten months later, 12 or 11 months later, 11 and a half months later, and then they're like, you know what? I'm just going to go find a different husband. He's been taking too long. That's not the bride of Christ. And there are a lot who would be that way. He's taking too long. That's what's happening today. A lot of people are like, the Lord's taking too long to come back. I'm not waiting anymore. Well, then you were a hypocrite. Because he gave his clear instructions 
on his return. And there are a lot of people who are just giving up. Well, don't give up because you fall into the category. Don't give up. The Lord said he's going to return. He's going to return. Do we really believe that? And that's the big, that's a big issue today. That's why I use that as an example. Because if we attend him out of love to him, we are his. And so if you hang on, you hang on because you know the truth. You hang on because you're hoping out of any hope towards him. You're hanging on because you love him and he told you to, and you care for him, and you're waiting for him. That's the bride. That's why Hebrews 9.28 jumps off the page to me. Because he says, I'm coming for those eagerly waiting for me. How many people have stopped watching? How many people don't eagerly wait for him anymore? I can tell you from 2019 on, just in America, thousands, if not more, stopped watching. They gave up. I, I saw their comments. A lot of people just went back to doing the same old thing in the world. And, and gave up, even to the point of going and attacking other Christians because they were so upset that it didn't happen when they thought it was going to. Because they were there for the free meal. They were there looking for the easy out. Well, it's not an easy out. It's hanging on. And so a lot of people are mad because it didn't happen in 2019 at the 70th year of Israel's rebirth. I think the Lord has kept it going. Not only does it fulfill the prophecies, not only does it fulfill the length of days it's supposed to fulfill, but it also purges the church of those who were just there for the fish sandwich. We're just there for a couple of coins. We're just there for the people patting them on the back and making them feel good about themselves. They weren't there for him. Those of us that have hung on are here for him. Those of us that are staying the course are here for him. Those of us who are watching and waiting, regardless of what the rest of the world says and does, we belong to him. Because only the true bride hangs on for her bridegroom. Only the true bride waits, no matter how long it takes. Let's say it took more than a year for the husband to come back and get his bride. Let's say it was a year and a half. Let's say it was two years. A true bride would still be waiting. Everyone else would have already fallen away long before. That's what's happening today. And it goes right into scripture. Great falling away. Who's hanging on? Who's staying the course? Who's here? Not for a free meal. Not for, you know, some good feelings. Who's here for the truth? Who's here for justice? Who's here for the Lord? You know, it's it's come down to the wire. It's come down to why are we really here? And we have to be honest with ourselves and each other. Why are we really here? Are we here for him or are we here for us? I'm here for him because I don't get much out of this. I have a joy within me of being able to serve my Lord and my brothers and sisters. And that's about it. There's just very little more. Take any 10 channels on YouTube. And put them to that same test and see if they stay. See, when it gets hard, that's when it usually chases away those who, oh, there's work involved? Oh, no thanks. And they, and they bounce. They dip. They're out. They're gone. No thank you. I'm happy just sitting in the back doing it in the easy way. This may be harsh for a lot of people, and some may have clicked away already. The facts remain, as is that the Lord makes it very clear and very evident who are really his and who aren't. And we have to be honest with ourselves, because if we aren't, and here's the takeaway from everything I've said, if we aren't his bride, if we aren't where we should be, if we're just here for a sandwich, if we're just here to feel good, if we're just here for some coins, if we're just here for, for whatever gain we can get out of it, we can change that now. We have a chance to change it. And that's the point. That, that's the that's the we have to stop what we're doing and repent. If we're that way, we gotta change. Because if we can discover that we're here for the wrong reasons, we still have time to change to make sure that we're here for the right reasons. See, a lot of people run when the messages get hard. A lot of people run when the messages get tough. Well, I'm delivering the message I'm being given. I, I can't change it or alter it. 
But this is a great test for all of us, a test of the heart, a test of truth, a test of our true intentions. And the Lord will put everyone through this test. He's doing it right now. Look at what happened with Israel. Look at how many Christians attacked them and sided with the Palestinians. 76% of the Palestinians people want Israel dead. And Christians are siding with them? Are you serious? And it is happening. Here's the test. The test is happening. The test of faith is happening right before our very eyes. Those who are his are hanging on and blessing Israel. Israel, win your war. Go and fight your fight. The Lord is with you. Lord, bring them peace. Bring them victory. Bring them through this. There's still a lot more that has to be done. They can't go out now. So why are we really following the Lord? Why are we really, are, are we there for the, the good feeling videos? And, and the, are you here watching for the videos that make you feel elated? Or are you here to get the truth? Are you here to, to really come to the core of what's really going on? What are my true intentions? Lord, let me find my life in thee and not in the mire of this world's favor and gain. If we're here for the world making us feel better about ourselves, we're wrong. If we're here uh, because we're trying to feel good about our situation, we're wrong. If we're here because we're trying to feel that elated feeling like we're being lifted up off the floor, we're wrong. If we're here for any reason involving us, we're wrong. We have to be here for him. We have to be here for Jesus Christ because we're his bride. That's why we're here. That's why we're the bride. We're chosen. And we should be waiting eagerly. While we're waiting, let's walk in faith and truth, trusting him for all things and hanging on to hope beyond hope. And when others fall away, we don't follow them. We don't get discouraged because of them. We keep going. Because there are some who are going to say, you know what? I'm not going to walk this path anymore. Hey, let's go off to the side over here. Look at this place. Let's go over here and hang out over here. No, thank you. Why not? I mean, we were walking. There's nothing happening. Let's just take a break. No, I'm going to keep going. Well, you, you have fun then. And then they go off the path and they go off back to the world. We're still trudging along. Keep going. That's the goal of what I'm doing here. One of them now, since we're so close, keep going. Don't give up now. Keep going. You know the truth. The truth has set you free. Can't stop now. Especially because they decide that we should do it. You know, when Satan gets into a heart, he's going to use that person to manipulate others. He's going to try to get others to, to stop looking, to others to give up, others to stop walking in faith. Just, just go along with everything. It's easier that way. Remember Adam and Eve? God restrained nothing from them. Except for one thing. And Satan went to Eve and said, he knew he couldn't get to Adam. Adam, I don't want nothing to do with you. But Eve, you know what? You can actually eat that. It's good food. Tastes good. Did God really say you were going to die? He used coercion. He used manipulation. He used deflection. Deflect the blame off himself, of course. And then he stood back and watched the show. But in his arrogance, he never realized that God was always watching. Well... We're not going to trick God either. He's always, he's always watching. And so if we're not genuine in our, in our faith, if we're not genuine in our walk, if we don't have integrity, like the devotion talked about, we're no better than a false professor. Now's the chance to change that. And I highly, highly recommend to anyone, if this hits home in your heart, and there's some of this, and you're like, you know what? This is me. I, I, I'm doing this. Now is your opportunity. Change it. Pause this video. Pray to the Lord and ask him. Lord, change me. I don't want to be like that anymore. I don't want to walk that path anymore. I don't want to be here for false pretenses anymore. I want to be here for genuine reasons. And those reasons involve you.
Go to him and talk to him and ask him about it and change this. Repent. Change your mind. It's way easier than the alternative. It's way easier than the other road. Even though the way is narrow and hard, it's still easier than the other road. The other road may be easier, but the problem is the destinations. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word, and thank you for this devotion. Father, I pray that all who are listening, all who stayed, I, I know some probably clicked away, that they would receive this message rightly and receive it the way, for the reason why I gave it. You gave me the message, you gave me the words, but that they would receive it properly. They would receive it in a way that would cause them to actually pause and, and consider these things. And so that if they find something off in their in their walk, in their belief, and why they're here, and why they're following you, that they have opportunity to change it. We have time to change it now. We have time to deal with these things now before the tribulation starts, before you come for your church. We have a chance to not be a hypocrite, to change the direction that we're going. Father, give us that ability. First of all, make sure that we're willing, but then give us the ability to do it. And if there's something that we're off on, if there's something that we're, we're, we're struggling with, Lord, give us strength to overcome it. So that when we're here, we're here for genuine reasons. We're here because our heart is pure and wants to follow you. We're here because we have the imputed righteousness and holiness of Jesus Christ, causing us to be that way so that we may stand no matter what happens. That if somebody out there decides they're going to try to coerce us, we stand our ground. That if the world tries to pull us, we will break away and run to you. Anytime anything gets bad or goes south or goes downhill, you are our focus regardless. And when they come and say, you got to give up your faith and die. I'm not, I don't know if it's going to happen to us or not. It might. Give up your faith or die. We will say, I'd rather die. I'm not giving up my faith. I'm not turning away from my Lord. And we will have no fear of it. Because we are here before, because of our love for you. And because of your love for us. That's what a bride does. Lord, help us understand. Help us recognize inconsistencies in our faith. Inconsistencies in our belief. Things that don't align with your word. And make us to readily grasp a hold of. And receive and accept conviction. Because conviction in the heart purges the heart. That if we do find something that's amiss, that we fix it. That when the water dries up, we're not like the bulrush and we just... I mean, you can't even find the evidence of the bulrush. It, it go, disappears so quickly when the water, when the marsh dries up. But instead, we'll be a deeply rooted tree. Rooted in faith. Rooted in truth. Rooted in you. And that we will stand the test of time. The storms. Anything that this world decides it wants to throw at us. And that the temptations of this world will have no effect on us anymore. Because we are enraptured with you. Thank you, Father, for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. I mean, it's no small thing to consider that I might be a hypocrite, that I might be off on certain things, that I might not be here for genuine reasons, but instead for selfish ones, that I might not be following him and calling myself a Christian for the right reasons. It takes a lot of soul searching. It takes a lot of contemplation. It takes a lot of, a lot of us pausing to think. To consider. And if we find something that we're lacking in, we got to change it. Now's the chance. Now's the time. Because there's a time coming when you won't get to. There's a time coming when the door will be shut. And those that are his will be gone. Let us not miss that opportunity. Let us not miss that time. And let us address these things with a pure heart. And if we find inconsistencies, repent. Change. Turn.
It is to our benefit and to his glory. If you're here for anything, make it for the things pertaining to the Lord, not for the things pertaining to us. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name, and I'll see you in the next video.